This is Common Courtesy with Sean Nicholas. Sneaking the fuck in, I'll be like. But I'm like, I'm, I'm like such a. <laughs> Nikki Prue. But you own this company essentially, say. Let's just call it like a bread making company. And you have. Courtney Harba. Tell me that this, like, you just, you just didn't have to you know. <laughs> fucking lies. Lies. That's all fucking lies. Angelique Young. And I'm fling, you know, if we gotta go to the strip club and find you a homegirl, I'm okay with that. <laughs> I just wanna watch, you know? And Steven Galebreath. And I used to think that, like, monogamy was natural and, like, you pick one person and that's, like, all you're supposed to do, but my mind has expanded since then. I'm excited. The gang's all here. Yay! Yay! Sit back and let's start the conversation. Yay! Hey, guys, and welcome back to Common Courtesy. I'm your host and moderator, Sean Nicholas, a.k.a. Desire Some More. And with me, I have my co-host, Nikki Prue. Hello! Hello, stranger. I know it's been a while. How are you? I'm good. It's been too long, though. I've I've seen you in person. Um, really fast. Just want to make a note. Um, Nikki, I mean, Angelique is uh, she's sick. She's under the weather. Steven's still on his mental mental sabbatical, and uh, Courtney's dealing with her life. <laughs> so we'll see them next week. Uh, so this week we are doing a lot of things. I'm really excited about this interview that we have coming up in just a moment with Keith McCantis. He's a former uh, NFL pro football player. He played for the Tampa Bay Bucks and also for my father's alma, alma mater, University of Alabama. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and getting to his story as well. We're going to talk a little bit about Kanye West and what happened with him last week and what he's actually talking about when he was urinating on his Grammy. And also, I wanted to speak on about President uh, President Trump uh, versus Vice President Trump in mental fitness, because there's been a lot of questions going on about that. I saw an article lately. Um, it was from, I think, MS, uh, CSNBC. They took a poll saying that 54% of Americans believe that President Trump is mentally unfit and 52% believe, you know, the same about uh, Biden as well. So we'll get into that later. But first, Nikki, I just want to ask you, like, what's been going on with you? Um, You know, I've been kind of just trying to work a bunch. I've been delivering for shipped um, and it's actually been going a lot better. So that's been good. Now that our car troubles are behind us. Oh. Um, on top of that, I have some new jewelry in the works um, that I'll be putting up this week um i have some things to finish but i should have some good new stock in so it's just been busy like pretty much constantly <laughs> same i'm working on a new sushi restaurant and like you know how has it been going um <laughs> we'll talk about that later well no it's been going great it's been going great just a couple of weekends ago the power went out twice during you know service and it was just Got to be a headache, but nightmare. yeah, it's a nightmare, dude. But um, you know, they handled it well. They closed early because it was it was getting a bit of a headache, and you know, it was for me and the customers. So let's get on to uh, Mr. McCantus. I have I put a little clip together for us, just to watch. And here we go. This is Keith McCantus. I had a three point eight grade point average in college. Now I can barely read or write. I got glaucoma. I can't see. You know what I'm saying the dementia to have taken a toll on me. That's enough to make you make you want to commit suicide. Thanks, Keith McCants, yeah. linebacker, University of Alabama. There he is, Keith McCants. Zero point one percent of the people make it to the National Football League, and I was number one in the world. I thought Keith was probably one of the best football players that ever come out ever come out of our area. Gosh, he was just a Tarzan on the field. He could do anything. So what people didn't know about, about Keith McCants coming out of the college and being a rated number one player in the country is that I had a bad leg. And one of the coaches said, okay, I signed a five-year, $7.6 million contract. And one of the coaches made the statement, uh, what the doctor said, McCants ain't going to last in five years. They said, we only need him for three. 27 doctors of, of the NFL looked at it, and they said that I can have surgery if I want to. Other than that, I just have to deal with the pain and play. I've been doing it for four years, and my knee is not a major concern. But my performance will take care of itself. I ain't thinking about no damage. I'm like, okay, then I feel good. I'm gonna go out here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna kick some butt. So I go out there, and I tear myself up even more. 
This arm, I can't raise over my shoulder. The triceps is deteriorating. My whole arm is deteriorating. I shot on my elbow twice, hitting the guy side his head, and continuing to play. I'm 46 years old, and today I can't lift my arm over my head. You take a player and you put him out there, and he get hurt, and you put some say, okay, you take this painkiller, you can play. If you don't take it, you can't play. The love and the passion that you have for the game, you're gonna go and do it. Yes. Hello, Mr. Keith McCantis. How are you? Fine. How you doing? Good, good. I just wanted to play a little bit of that interview I saw a couple of years ago, um, just to, you know, get us in the uh, mindset a little bit. But I just kind of wanted to see how you've been doing since the whole pandemic been going on. I'm, I'm, I'm making it, man. I'm making it. It's like every other, uh, other American. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully good. So let's get into this interview because I wanted to ask you a lot of questions. Um, so take us back, Keith. Uh, when you first found out that you're going to the NFL, you were drafted in 1990. You had a stellar year um, in 89 in college. You had standout year, and you're one of the first, um, kind of one of the first in America. Well, one of the first. Uh, I don't know how to talk today. You kind of one of the first draft picks there, and you're going to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Tell us about that feeling of having your dreams kind of come true a little bit. Well, actually, I was disappointed, really. I don't really know why, but I was supposed to be the number one pick. And I, I wrote a book called My Dark Side of the NFL. You should get that book and read it. I used to talk about any and everything that, you know, I, didn't, I, don't, I don't cover nothing up. I don't, I don't sugarcoat it. And the NFL are very powerful, powerful people. And they came to me and they said, okay, um, they, Atlanta sent a guy named Lynn Pescarelli down to Mobile to do a chop job on me. And in that chop job, he's supposed to do an interview to, to build me up. And instead, he told me down. And that's what they do, and they want you to fall in the draft. When you fall in the draft, then they don't have to pay you as much money. And according to um, different sources, I lost about $7 million on that deal going to Tampa Bay. But I still end up with the biggest contract in history. For a defensive player, and that's why they get paid. Everybody get paid today. <laughs> so my next question was going to be: um, so you mentioned um, in a couple of interviews that um, you had this knee injury coming out of college, and what you said was, you know, uh, either you're going to play, you know, take this drug, you know, uh, and you can play, or you know. You, you're not going to play. And you also mentioned that, you know, there's a line of different people. Like, if you had to get a shot for the play, I mean, to play the game, you were in this line. If you didn't, you were in that line. Uh, take us back to that. How, I mean, how how did that work? I mean, I just didn't know that about the NFL. I know. Don't, don't nobody see what goes on behind the closed doors of the National Football League. When you see a guy get hurt on practice and he's limping off the field, he go in the locker room and come back running greater than ever. Um, when I came out of college, they had that big room about my knees, and uh, they said, "Well, five point well, seven point six million dollar contract for five years." Doctor said, "Well, I can't say gonna last for five years, so this is just this is just, this is need pretty bad." They said, "We don't need him for, for three years." So if he said that, then well, why would he say something like that? And then it is well. I'm getting paid a lot of money, so they got to get me on the field. And if I'm injured, wow, they don't want the big money to go to waste, so they shoot you up and they numb me up. And when in the process of that happening, I start tearing, tearing myself up faster than normal because I couldn't feel nothing. And then after that, I start getting it. After, 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 after the cortisone so we'll wore off, now it goes to Percocet's tie lock, more tap, morphine shots. Of the deal because the pain was getting so unbearable, and it got to the point where I didn't even have to practice. You say game shakes, you play the games. I sit there and, and die, the analysis of the, the, the offense, break it down, study them, look at their weakness, get the, get the, everything I can get. And business just said, I have to stay in physical condition to game, game, game shake. You know what I mean? Because doing the practice, being in the practice, you know, wear and tear. It's too costly. So I get paid to play. That's what we do. 
uh, Nikki, let's go to you. Um, it, well, it's funny because I was actually going to comment on that, um, what you said about them saying, well, we only need him for three years. That just kind of struck me as, um, you know, especially, I mean, I know hiring and employment is totally different. It's a totally different world in the NFL, but that just struck me as such a, well, we only need him for three years kind of thing. He has an injury. We'll be able to medicate him through it. I mean, that's just that's a disgraceful way to treat people in my opinion. And I'm sorry that you were forced into that choice. Um, I mean, I just, I, I don't really know what my question is. I just, Sean kind of asked it um, for me, but that's the one thing that I really just, one of the things that really stood out for me. And I just, I didn't, I didn't like that statement right off the bat. So I'm kind of glad that you brought it up too. Cause that, that's just, you know, I mean, you, yeah, I, I, can see that you had a lot of passion for the game and for your career and you were treated really unfairly and poorly you know you take care of your your people and it, it doesn't sound like you were taken care of well no and they, and I'm, let me tell you this i wrote this book my dark side of the nfl not just because it's key for my story people like julia say jeff on bob contrary andre water People who had lost the ability to live life on their terms and, and, and took their own life. I was one of those players. So, therefore, that book uh, called My Dogs Are in a Veil, it explains and breaks down everything that any individual has gone through. I tried to commit suicide because of love and passion I have for the game. And then they kick you to the curb because um, you're no longer you're beneficial to the team. They only got a handful of players that they take care of. Yes, commentators. Um, what's the tight end name for? Certain Sh Sh Shannon, Shannon Sharp. Um, right. Emmitt Smith. Guys that don't need the, the help or need the money or nothing like that. So they said they're going to come out and say, give me a job then. I can't I can't work because I'm not physically able to. I'm totally, I'm, I'm probably like disabled, like handicapped now. I walk with a cane. Got to have a hip replacement. I'm in pain every day. I choose not to do the things I used to do. So I, I want to make a difference and not, try, not, not, not trying to discredit them here, but to educate people that don't know. Right. My next one was going to be, do you feel that, you know, from what I saw from a lot of interviews and from what you're saying now, do you feel that you were exploited by the NFL? Because, I mean, to have you play through pain when, normally in other jobs, you know, it's, that just wouldn't happen. Do you feel that they're not only exploiting you, but other players and maybe perhaps to this day? No doubt. And uh, one, of the things, one of the first things I tell you, we don't pay this kind of money to sit on the bench. Get back in there. Sam Wise, my ball came out, came out of my shoulder. I was hitting Barry Sanders. That we don't pay you to have any dollars we can't sit on the bench. Get him back in there. Shoot him up, wrap him up, tie him up, just go in there. I'm like, I can't. He said, just go out there and stand up for just, just, just 45 more seconds because your presence makes your presence make the difference on the field. I'm just saying, I'm saying, if I'm out there on the field, they ain't going to try to do certain things. Therefore, my, just my, my presence being out there made a difference. Um, and when you bring a substitute, they, that, that's, that's normally who they going to go after. You know what I'm saying? So it's just, just like we were playing with Houston Oilers, but around, we put the first quarterback out. Okay, now we better bring everything we got because we're gonna rather the second quarterback. He already nervous, and we know this. So if I was going at the game, they're probably gonna hit the scene, which they did while I was at the game, and they made a touchdown. I hit something on a touchdown, Barry Sanders. So I, that was my fault. So I had to eat that one. Yeah. So I was gonna ask also as well before we move on to our next topic. Um, so Colin Kaepernick, I just want to ask you about that. He was kneeling and you know, kind of making a statement for the Black Lives Matter movement and mostly uh, police violence against people of color. Do you feel that if you, let's say you're playing today, do you feel that one, what, do you think sports should be in politics? And two, do you respect what he did? No, I don't because if you get sports in politics, well, first off, the one thing that breaks racism down is sports that bring all color, national, it bring everything together. 
Now you got no animosity, you got nothing, nothing. Everybody root for root, root for their team. Everybody getting along. Sports is the one thing that break it down. And sports could be the one thing that tell Tyler Seeks apart. In my opinion. Because they think it's leave, leave, stay out of it. Leave it alone. Unless you, uh, everybody wasn't, wasn't, wasn't born to be a politician. Yeah, good point. The great point. I wasn't expecting that answer. I was like, oh, we never know what's going to say. I love this show. So let's go ahead. I do too. So let's go ahead and move on. Wait, I do have, I do have, wait, one more just to like, just to say this. So, because you said at a certain point, you say that you, you were homeless and whatever, whatnot. You, you absolutely, you feel that you were abandoned by the uh, NFL. Do you I'm think? I'm glad you brought that up because yeah. I was thinking the same exact thing. Exactly. I feel like this. I was homeless for two years, ate out the garbage can. Didn't know who Keith McCann's was from the concussions and the dementia and the suppression that I suffer from. I was a fucking millionaire and didn't know it. So when they did finally put me in the mental institution for 60 days, I was, I was real broke for real then. Yeah, I stole everything. So, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Like, I just, they I just kind of. Was dead. They said, they said I was dead, Vegas. They said I was dead. So, I mean, I just, I just find this story just incredibly, like you know. I really, <laughs> I think you're incredibly brave and strong for going through what you did, and I know everybody says, well, you know, you don't have a choice. It's either the only way out is through, but I, I think that um, just your strength is an inspiration, and I think it's great that you want to bring awareness to this kind of a problem because it is huge. Because exactly, just what Sean said. They, they did that. They put you in a place to need something and then abandon you. And that's wrong. And that shouldn't happen. You're right. So hopefully I was I could be the last one that happened to me, which I doubt it. But they have made some changes and they're doing, doing some great things now. Uh, trying to help, help uh, ex-players uh, get hip replacement and knee replacement and, and help, help them I guess medicate them the right way because we talk, I take 183 pills a week. Yeah. They said I, was, I didn't know what an addict was. I didn't know what an addict was. Then you just get, we put a ball of pills in there and I take them as, as I need them. Like two, well, you two. don't think about it that way when you're using it to get rid of real pain. You know, yeah. you're not thinking about chasing a high. You just want to make pain go away. So I can't after, even imagine. And after they shoot you up the quarters on tour, though, you you know mm -hmm. up. And then after the game, after they wear off, oh my God. You know what I'm saying? Like, you just got a surgery. Those shots are, are fairly dangerous, aren't they? You're not supposed to get a lot of them, I, I thought, or, or, or a lot in a row. Exactly. Well, one 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 one, one particular uh, incident that happened as well, playing, was playing against uh, the Philadelphia Eagles in Arizona. They shot me up so much, and I was running, and I couldn't feel my leg. One of the best games I ever had, I was running, <laughs> I, running, I fall. I told him. God, what is it? But I couldn't feel anything. So now I'm Superman. I'm gonna go back to old Keith McCann. I'm gonna jump in the light this place up when I did. After the game, hurting yeah. like hell. <laughs> I'll be retired. It's over. Uh, well, I hope. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. And um, make sure you check this out the book called My Dark Side of NFL by Keith McCann and the players that have taken their own lives. I speak for them. It's a, it's a great book. I think it's a quick, easy read. It's, it's a true story. I'm going to read it. I'm going to read that too, for sure. Like, I really hope your story, honestly, I hope your story really helps a lot of people because, like, this type of thing happened with you people in the WWF, you know, or the WWE. They make all this money for this company. And then after you leave, they don't give you any, like, health insurance or any type of way. They don't like, do anything for you. They take your life and do nothing for you. Exactly. Like, I really think that I really think that it should it should be changed, you know, because that's not OK, because you don't hear stories like these. But you know what? What I'm glad to hear is that you're making a recovery, Keith. Like that's another story we don't usually hear. You know, we hear people are addicts. And I read the papers, you know, I saw the articles, but no one's wondering. My question was like, no one's wondering, well, how did he get addicted? Well, of course, the NFL. And I didn't know they were just giving it to you. You know, like it's insane. But um. 
we're going to read that book and we're going to move on to our next topic. What I really wanted to get into, you guys, was talking about, you know, first I want to talk about the president and Joe Biden. You know, they're talking about the mental fitness of each of these two people. I think it's very important that we kind of talk about it because the next person that's going to be elected is going to be the president for the next four years, making important decisions not only for themselves, but for the country and with America, the world. So I just put a little clip together to kind of see who and who is mentally uh, fit. I love that. <laughs> I hope they now go and take a look at the oranges, or the oranges of the uh, uh, investigation, the beginnings of that investigation. The Mueller report, I wish, covered the oranges, how it started. In the failing New York Times by an anomalous, really an anomalous, gutless coward. You just look. This is the very definition of totalitarianism. Shield and shelter, criminal. Look, look, wait. I, I'm not sedentary. I don't. I get up and, and, and no, let, 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 let him go. Let him go. Look, the reason I'm running is because I've been around a long time and I know more than most people know. And I can get things done. That's why I'm running. And you want to check my shape on? Let's do push-ups together here, man. Let's do. Let's run. Let's do whatever you want to do. Let's take my pizza. You ever been to a caucus? No, you haven't. You're a lying dog face pony soldier. You said you were. Make sure the television, the, excuse me, make sure you have the record player on at night. The, the, the phone. We hold these truths to be self evident. All men and women created by, go, you know the, you know the thing. Poor kids are just as bright and just as talented as white kids. I'm beginning to see why your wife left you. Ed, if you agree with me, go to Joe 30330 and help me in this fight. Thank you very much. <laughs> I'm sorry. I know. I just... It started with the oranges. Yeah, and no, the next thing... <laughs> wow. No, I, mean, I didn't mean to start laughing. I, oh, kind of my first time, I'm sorry. It's my, kind of my oh. first time watching that through through. Because I just, I just kind of edited it all together. I also have... <laughs> Because they, if you ask me, they both look like old fools. Let's go to uh, Nikki. Let's go to you first and see how <laughs> you. Here's my question: Like, out of the two of them, who's who's more mentally fit to lead the country? All right. Have you seen the stickers that say, <laughs> "Okay, fine, Biden," but this is bullshit. That's not exactly how I even feel it. I don't know how I feel at this point. Remember when we first, when we were doing this show months ago and we had this giant pool of candidates to choose from and how hopeful we all were and excited and like looking them up. And I was just like, you know what? This is going to be different. And here we, here we are again. I honestly don't even like, I've been suppressing all my feelings about this upcoming election I still need to mail like mail in my thing for my like mail in ballot. I'm probably going to end up just going there because every time I get one, I look at it on my counter for like two or three days and then I just get mad again at my choices and I tear it up and throw it in the trash. Like I'm definitely going to vote, but I'm really mad about it. And OK, here's what I want to say. I think it would be really great and easy for all of us to say that Trump was mentally incapable on I, unfortunately, I really don't think that's the case. I think he is just ignorant and foolish <laughs> and not eloquent and really doesn't care what he says at all. He just doesn't care. Like a mental illness is almost too kind of a diagnosis because I think he's just an idiot. Like, I don't even think he's a monster. I just think he's not... <laughs> Yeah. Okay. You know what? Maybe he's not mentally equipped, but I don't think it's because of an illness. I think it's because he just has like a block, like a teenage boy who doesn't want to do. Th he just, I mean, the anyway, Joe Biden, however, I really <laughs> wanted to believe in this man, but I am actually concerned for his mental health. I really don't think that, I mean, just Trump says outrageous things all the time, but I feel like <laughs> Biden has said some things that like you would, I don't know it. I don't know where they're coming from. A lot of the times I don't even know what they mean. And it's not because I don't understand political terms. 
It's just because he's not really making sense. So basically, long story short, um, in different ways, no, I don't think either of them are mentally fit. But like, these are our options. Once again, here we are. <laughs> going to be another great four years regardless. Keith, let's go to you. I mean, I don't know how much you've been paying attention to the political cycle, but just from that video, um, you wrong for that. You wrong for that. You did that. You wrong for that. <laughs> You're like, wrong for that. Like, kids going at it. <laughs> and um, you right, Nikki. I don't think neither one of them are capable of running this country. Let's go with Kanye West. That's another one. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So how I feel, I feel, I agree with both of you, but you know, my thing is with Trump, it's like, remember that book called Fear written by Bob Woodard? And that was all, you know, on the record interviews, whatever, whatnot, like, you know, he's being recorded. Well, there's another book written by the same guy <laughs> called Rage. And it has in the, in the book and a recording because it came out a couple of weeks ago of Donald Trump speaking about the fact that he knew back in February that the coronavirus was deadly and airborne. And I think that was before we even knew that. And But he was telling this reporter that I already wrote this insinuary book about him, this fucking news and having him recorded. And then in August, you hear the president speaking to Bob Woodard on the phone, trying to get him not to release the book. To me, I think that's mentally unfit because how is it that all these books are coming out from the White House right now, and even from the president's own lips, wow. the president's own lips, giving you everything you need. And then I, because if it were me, I certainly wouldn't say, I wouldn't tell a reporter what I talked about with, you know, the president of China. I wouldn't give him details, especially not that. And then to go out and, you know, downplay and basically lie to America. Well, you people. wouldn't, but there's a lot of really sneaky reporters who get information. I think one of the reasons that all these books are coming out now is because the country is such a mess. It's like mom and dad are on vacation. So <laughs> everybody's like, how can we profit? Release it. Just get it out there. Get it out there. It's a no, no, Nikki, Bob, he knew that Bob was recording him. He knew. He even knew that this is like, That's I, said, what I mean by like, this uh, is the same dude. This is the same, the same dude wrote a book about him. Not even like two years ago called fear and about you know Trump's shitty White House. I mean, how how much are you there to give this same type of interview to the same guy knowing he's not just gonna sit on this, he's gonna do what? Write another fucking book. And yeah. he, al he almost got into trouble with this, you know, about saying, you know, he knew how dangerous it was and then going out to rallies. And it, I mean, come on, he's saying it was it's deadly, but he was holding rallies. So I mean like I mean it doesn't I, I get by I get what people say about Biden though, because like Biden does you know, what I, I, do. I feel like like but okay, there's my only distinction, and I'm sorry I don't mean to cut you off, is that like yes, that I and I totally agree <laughs> with all that, but I feel like it's more like him just being like, Meh, I don't know, whatever whatever's gonna what 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 should I say now? I feel like it's more of like a like not planned. I don't even mean like intelligently planned. I just feel like whatever is gonna work best in his favor, he flip-flops and he just thinks he can do that. But some of the things that come out of Biden's mouth don't even like exist in this realm of reality. Like they just he's he does babble. Well, neither did when Trump was saying like Tola, he was trying to say anonymous. He's like anonymous. Oh my god, no, that's that, that made me lose it the second time because or, I, I, I could watch that stuff all day. And I'm not saying like Bi Biden would be a worse choice. I'm just worried about in two years from now if his if his mental capacity deteriorates further, what are we in for? I don't think, honestly, I don't think for me, I, don't, I was going to invite the situation either way. Like, I honestly don't, I'm playing devil's advocate with myself. Right. No, I, I honestly don't think, I'm going to get to Keith, but I, I honestly don't think that Biden, you know, he has a slip of a tongue. Like, who doesn't say the wrong, like, you know, he, he doesn't really say, like, you're a lying horse face, you know, lie or something no, like that. He doesn't say hateful things. It's just kind it's of funny. like a super babble sometimes. It's, but he doesn't, for me, though, I don't see Biden giving, like, you know, on the record interviews about two people, two reporters, you know, giving them sensitive information. Cause that's what we we're talking about, you know, earlier when Biden, I mean, sorry, when Trump is running, is he going to be giving out sensitive information? 
with this with this book that just coming out now, I'm like, of course he is. I'm surprised. I don't I don't know who the else the fuck he's talking to, but I really feel like for me mentally on fitness is to kind of know the difference between you know what I'm saying, what I should say to someone. Now, like with Biden, like I said, I just he's an old person, but I don't think that he's un. You know, I don't think, and I don't think he's going to do And I'm not necessarily saying, I think, okay, I'm sorry. I know what you're saying, though. Yeah, I don't think he, again, I'm like, I don't, I would rather, of course, I don't want another four years of this crap, but I'm like, oh my God, what, I'm just kind of now I'm thinking like, what's going to happen this way and what's going to happen this way? And, and then I just drink wine and stop. (laughs) Keith, how did you, did you want to chime in real fast on this? This is what I think. I think all uh, all presidents got a go-to man, uh, somebody they consult with, and give the, give 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 their get get an opinion or, or advice. And except Donald Trump, he just gonna do what the hell he want to do anyway. I mean, because, That's yeah, a really good point. Talk about a wealthy man with power, and yeah, he trying to make his country rich again like him. And so I don't think he gonna listen to no damn body. First of all, because he know it all. And with our past president, they always had a go-to person to consult and make the best decision possible for the country. I agree with that. Like, that's my whole thing. I agree with that because that's my whole thing. I just don't think that this president is doing that. He will do that. He never does. And that's an issue, you know, because I I think he's done some great things for the country. But I think they're like kind of Band-Aids. And I feel like once they're kind of like weirdly backhanded a lot of the time. Yeah. So I kind of feel like in a couple of years we're gonna feel all this shit. But I mean suddenly I want change. I'm just I'm like just I don't know. It's more like kind of a roulette wheel of like what's gonna happen in the next four years, regardless. Like I do definitely want change. I you know, you know me. Yeah. But it's like it's scary now because I just we had so much hope and now we're just kind of like All right, so let's move on to our next topic. Um, So last week, Kanye West was seen, well, he wasn't seen. He went through a Twitter rant. He was going through a lot. He was talking about um, the music industry and the exploitation that's actually going on there. But what kind of, like, kind of muddled that was uh, a video of him on Twitter peeing on his Grammy. And there's a little screenshot. I would show you the video, but I'm not disgusting. Um... (laughs) But Thank some you. of the screenshots that he said he sent was uh, here's one of them. Um, I need to see everybody's contracts at Universal and Sony. I'm not going to watch when people, my people, be enslaved. I'm putting my life on the line for my people. The music industry and the NFL are modern day slave ships. Yeah. I'm the new Moses, and he also wrote, "Everyone, please cover me, uh, cover me in prayer. I'm the one of the most famous people on the planet, and Universal won't tell me what my masters cost." because they know I can afford them. Black masters matter. Now, when he was talking about masters, these are like the master mixes of any record that any artist puts out. And it's generally known that, you know, even actors, when you do a movie, the studio owns the master. But in music, I think it's a little bit different because they're like independent contractors. Um, Kanye is basically fighting for ownership of his own music and not only his, other people's. But this pinging thing, I don't know. So I want to go to the panel. One, how do you feel about this whole thing? And do you think he went a little too far with pissing on the Grammy? Let's go to Keith first. Well, he just pissing on the Grammy? He must be pissed off. <laughs> <laughs> but he was right when he said that we are in the slave. NFL, NBA, we are in the slave. And I, I can understand where you're coming from and why he said that. Uh, because although we make a lot of money, the owners make the real money. Hundreds of millions of dollars a year. They make the real money, and we pay the price. We were like Junior Seau, Jeff Owen, Bobby Shreds, Andre Ward, Keith Gant. People have taken their own lives because we lost the bill of real life on my turn. Why they make another hundred million dollars a year? Yeah, I can do it. I can do it. And then. They want to kick us in surgery like we never existed. The movie con- Concussions, that's me in that movie. I'm begging the NFL for help. They said, but my lawyer said, I had a nervous breakdown. I said, my lawyer called and said, oh, my cancer got a nervous breakdown. I said, well, my cancer was crazy before he got here. So I'm going to get up my gun. I'm going to show you crazy. 
I don't know how, how it's, it's all in the book how it's going to happen. I was going to be the postman of the NFL. That's what I was planning on doing until I don't know if somebody stopped me. So, yeah, I, I, I agree with that, Frank. Nikki, how did you feel? And do you, like I said, do you think he went a little too far with the, you know, pissing on the, the Grammy thing? Do you understand what he's saying? Honestly, um, you know, I, I had read this story briefly before you mentioned it um, earlier or whatever it was the other day. And, you know, I didn't read much into it, didn't know what to think. But after reading that article, I was really surprised. I mean, I guess I'm just really naive, but... Um, just like with the story that th knowing what goes on in the NFL and the NBA and all of that behind the scenes, I was really surprised to know that he, like someone as famous as Kanye West would have to fight for the rights to his music, essentially. That's insane to me because just knowing just how big he is, how everything he's done, it's kind of a, a unsettling thought to think that even celebrities who have attained that status would have to fight for their own music, the own, the, the, the music that they created or collaborated with or, or what have you. And it was kind of an eye opener. And I mean, normally, I mean, I feel like Kanye can be kind of over the top. <laughs> he can be kind of over the top in general, but I mean, this was, this was a situation I was previously unaware of and I would be really pissed off too. I mean, I feel like it's, you think about working even in a really, really small scale, you're working for a company and they do something similar to you and then give you a company award at the Christmas party. You're going to want to smash it on the floor or pee on it. But I, um, you know, I mean, he's probably not been getting any results and he's probably really, really frustrated and really, really pissed off. And at this point, knowing what I do, I I really can't, I can't blame him at all. I can't really fault him for that. Me either. Cause honestly, I mean, this is kind of reminiscent a little bit of um, Britney Spears. We talked about Britney Spears being free of her conservative shit. You know, yeah. Thought. She has to fight for her own life, but I really see what, you know, what Keith just said. I, I'm glad I brought this uh, topic up on the same um, episode that he's on because, you know, I was like, wow, he's Keith. Mm. Exploited by the um, exploitation is uh, exploited by the um, NFL, and now you know we're seeing this happen with Kanye and Universal and Sony, and this is like countless other articles. I mean, artists, and what he also mentioned was that you know we lost that artists lost a lot of money over the pandemic because they didn't own their own music, so basically they only get their money from touring and merchandise, but they couldn't tour, so they couldn't really use their music to make their money back. So I kind of I fully understand what he's saying because like legally like if, if i'm the one singing the song i should have some type of ownership over it and i'm doing all the work you know i mean i get that right the song but it has to be some type of a i have to have some type of control of my own work like this show here if anyone ever asks me for like you know video whatever or not you know you were one of the other co-hosts i would definitely give it to you but i own i mean i own the i own the master but you own it too because you're on the show and you're putting work on it so you definitely own it as well. So I don't really understand. I get all the legal stuff and the, the money. Just like Keith said, they're making millions. Like um, how many of those one hit wonders we have out there? You know, they went out and they recorded a great one hit song. And now we don't hear from them. I wonder how they're doing. You know, so I mean, I think this is a big. We know how they're taken care of. Yeah. I think it's a bigger conversation for the country, basically, because, you know, we're allowing things to slide under the nose under our noses, excuse me, because I didn't know what was going on with uh, the NFL. I had no idea. I wonder what's going on in the NBA, probably the same fucking shit. But the special well, music- Imagine any kind of physical sport, I imagine, right? Yeah, like the, the music industry, I definitely, I, I mean, I'm an actor and I've, I have, I'm not rich and famous, but I've seen exploitation going on in the acting world, you know? Some shady auditions where, you know, you, show, you have to show up by yourself. You know, it's just, it, it's there. I'm, it I'm used to drug kids in acting. I mean, I'm sure it, to some level it still happens, but back in the day they would, you know, like if a, a child, a really a child star, a Shirley Temple, um, Judy Garland, there's been a lot of them that have, have, you know, the same thing. You know, we need to be, you need to be up, but now you need to sleep, but now you need to be up, 
And, and then afterwards, what do you do with yourself when you've been fed life, you know, life getting through pills and then they go away? That's a nightmare. I can't even imagine putting that's somebody through that or going through it. That's, that's, a, that's a great point. What do you do? You know, you know what happened? You lost. You lost. And then you try to lean on somebody and then, and, and then you tell them the story. They, they're in shock because they thought you had it better than what you got it. You know, as far as some contracts are concerned with, the, with, the, with the, uh, the, the, the Kanye West, when you sign the contracts in the NBA, NFL, and the music contract, you sign a, a deal with the devil. That fine print that you don't see. That's what it sounds like. Yeah. yeah. He was even saying that, you know, some of the contracts that they sign need to be simplified because, you know, they shouldn't be their lawyers reading it over to you. It should be your own lawyer reading it to you. I mean, I can only imagine what what these contracts have done. And I mean, I we can see it right here. You know, we can see it with Amy Winehouse and especially Julie Garland, you know, like her, like she was a part of the whole studio code where you can only work for one studio and they had to fight to get out of that. But mm -hmm. even while she was in it, you're right. They had to give her the drugs and stuff like this. It's just, I, I, I mean, I think this is a good thing that we live in 2020 and we're allowed to shed some light on these things because I, for one, am not okay with it. I'm not, you know, I think that we all should have a choice in our right. life. We shouldn't be used like that. It just, and well, you shouldn't have to choose between living your dream and pursuing your passion and being good at it and being healthy. That yeah. should not be a thing at all. And one of the things I'd like to say is like, when I talk to college athletes or high school athletes, it's one thing to get to the NFL. What are you willing to do to stay in the NFL? That's the question that they want to know. Which is, Will you take this shot? They ask me when I take a shot. Maybe if I have to, I wouldn't mind going to Miami Dolphins and I sitting on the cone at a nice size contract. And I just saw like I couldn't do it. I said, I ain't gonna take the needle no more. Jimmy Johnson told me, we ain't got no use for you then. Cause it's a fine line between hurt and being injured. That's a good point. I am, I understand that now a lot more because yeah. it's I mean, because like you were saying in your interview, you're like, I was 21. I didn't know any better. And who would? Who? How would you? Of, of course. You know, you, I didn't know shit. Well, I still don't know shit. And I definitely didn't know shit when I was 21 years old. Like 0.1% of people make it to the National Football League. And I was number one in the world. You're living your dream. You, I want to go out the field and, and, and play in front of the world. So and they knew all along that was a limited and so they numb that up, man. And every time I got I got arrested for some drugs or something like that, it's like, I ain't no drugs. I ain't doing, I don't, I don't rob, steal, cheat, lie, and lip, and all that stuff. I just want to get rid of my pains at any cost. And that's when I become suicidal because I couldn't. Well, we have to definitely have you back on the show again because honestly, this conversation for me and I'm sure for others uh, soon because I have to like, I'm going to, spread this around this conversation for me and I'm pretty sure for Nikki as well was very eye-opening and I think everyone needs to hear your story and your book again is my dark side of the NFL by Keith my, dark, dark. my dark side of the NFL yes okay all right guys that was common it tonight hello that was common courtesy guys again um i'm sean nicholas aka desire some more we got nikki Prue right next to me and a special thank you with for our guest keith mccants for joining us and again remember go out there and get that book my dark side of the nfl by keith mccants we'll see you next time <laughs>